Let's begin our service by praying together the Collect for Purity. Almighty God, to you all hearts are open, all desires known, and from you no secrets are hid. Cleanse the thoughts of our hearts by the inspiration of your Holy Spirit, that we may perfectly love you and worthily magnify your holy name. Through Christ our Lord. Amen. And let's say together the summary of the law. Jesus said, You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your mind. This is the great and first commandment, and a second is like it. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. On these two commandments depend all the law and the prophets. My dear brothers and sisters, the scriptures teach us to acknowledge our many sins and offenses, not concealing them from our Heavenly Father, but confessing them with humble and obedient hearts, that we may obtain forgiveness by His infinite goodness and mercy. We ought at all times humbly to acknowledge our sins before Almighty God. But especially when we come together in His presence to give thanks for the great benefits we have received at His hands, to declare His most worthy praise, to hear His holy word, and to ask for ourselves and on behalf of others those things which are necessary for our life and our salvation. Therefore, draw near with me to the throne of heavenly grace. And let's pray together for the forgiveness of our sins. Most merciful God, we confess that we have sinned against you in thought, word, and deed, by what we have done and by what we have left undone. We have not loved you with our whole heart. We have not loved our neighbors as ourselves. We are truly sorry and we humbly repent. For the sake of your Son, Jesus Christ, have mercy on us and forgive us, that we may delight in your will and walk in your ways to the glory of your name. Amen. Almighty God, our Heavenly Father, who in his great mercy hath promised forgiveness of sins to all those who sincerely repent and with true faith turn to him. Have mercy upon you, pardon, and deliver you from all your sins. Confirm and strengthen you in all goodness, and bring you to everlasting life. Through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. And let's reaffirm our faith in the words of the Apostles' Creed. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord. He was conceived by the power of the Holy Spirit and born of the Virgin Mary. He suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended to the dead. On the third day, he rose again. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of the Father. He will come again to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Let's listen to the Word of God. Our reading today is taken from 1 Peter chapter 3, verses 8 to 12. Finally, all of you should be of one mind, sympathize with each other, love each other as brothers and sisters, be tender-hearted, and keep a humble attitude. Don't repay evil for evil. Don't retaliate with insults when people insult you. Instead, pay them back 
with a blessing. That is what God has called you to do, and he will grant you his blessing. For the scriptures say, If you want to enjoy life and see many happy days, keep your tongue from speaking evil and your lips from telling lies. Turn away from evil and do good. Search for peace and work to maintain it. The eyes of the Lord watch over those who do right, and his ears are open to their prayers. But the Lord turns his face against those who do evil. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Well, some of you might know that I love to play sports. Come to think about it, I love to play lots of things. I love to play golf. I love to play hockey. I love to ride my bike. I love to play my guitar, my bass. I play around with paints and a brush. And the thing about playing an instrument or playing any kind of sport is that over the years, you develop habits. And many times these habits are firmly fixed, not only in your mind, but your body as well. I think it's called something like muscle memory. So for example, it's my tendency to try and hit a golf ball and swing as fast and hard as possible. And often the result is not good. But if I slow the swing down, concentrate, keep my head down, eye on the ball and all of that, voila, a better shot. We live in a culture today that for the most part has put Christianity on the back burner. And because you and I are influenced and part of that culture, it is often really difficult to unlearn some of our old bad habits. And it's like what the Apostle Paul said in Romans chapter 7, I don't really understand myself for what I want to do, what is right, but I don't do it. Instead, I do what I hate. Why? Why do we do that? Obvious, bad habits. But on the positive side, we long to stand up for our faith, and yet we can be afraid. We can be intimidated by people who would simply write us off as religious weirdos or fanatics. How is a Christian supposed to act? Let's pray before we dive into our passage for this week. May the words of my mouth and the meditations in all of our hearts be truly acceptable to you, O Lord, our strength and our Redeemer, Amen. Now, as you know, we've been slowly making our way through the Apostle St. Peter's first letter. And you'll remember that he's been encouraging his readers to persevere, especially during difficult times. The early church was under persecution, of course, and pressure from a culture that did not share its point of view. So, of course, this is a timely study. I mentioned way back in our study that when we first meet Peter in the Bible, his name is Simon. And then, of course, Jesus renames him Peter, meaning rock. Well, just think about that. Jesus is transforming him into another kind of person. Rock-like. Solid, as it, as it were. So, how do you and I become solid people of faith. Well, of course, by the renewal of the power of the Holy Spirit, at the same time, of course, like in anything, there is a response on our part. And that is what this passage is pointing out. Peter's advice comes from the Word of God. So you'll notice that he brings in an Old Testament text, in this case, Psalm 34 and the gospel of grace. As you heard me say many times, we read the Bible as a whole. 
And I encourage you again to be a student of the whole Bible. And in our passage, there are quotes from a few verses from Psalm 34. By the way, a fabulous psalm. Read it later today before going to sleep. Some scholars think that it is used, it was used in training up newly convert the newly converted to Christianity, even a kind of discipleship manual. I like to think that it was perhaps a hymn, a worship song of the early church. And as they sung, as they sung Psalm 34, it sunk into their hearts. Notice in verse 10, it says this, If you want to enjoy life and see many happy days, well, who wouldn't? So the psalm goes on to explain that we should watch, interesting enough, the way we speak and act. That's what Psalm 34 is getting at. Remember what Peter has been telling us throughout the letter thus far. He says this often, be careful to live properly among your unbelieving neighbors, then even if they accuse you of doing wrong, they will see your honorable behavior. Then they'll give honor to God when he comes to judge the world. When Christians are careful in how they live, hopefully outsiders will notice and want to know what we are about. So how, of course, do we live? The passage points out six different ways. But before we look at them, another gentle reminder from Pastor Paul. Don't forget that Peter has already pointed out that you and I are holy. We are dearly loved, a royal priesthood, a chosen people. All because of Jesus and what he's done for you and me. And it's because of who we are in Jesus that our life flows in a different way, often countercultural. We are in Christ, and good behavior and righteous living is a byproduct of that. So these following characteristics and qualities should flow from that place, from the heart. What are they? One. Unity. Verse 8. Be of one mind. Sounds a bit like John chapter 17, a long section where Jesus emphasizes in his prayer that the disciples may be one. Unified, like-minded. It means an inner unity of attitude that makes schism unthinkable. That was on Jesus' heart as he prayed just before he went to the cross. It was also in the early church's mind as well. Acts chapter 2, verse 42. All the believers devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching, to the fellowship, to the sharing of meals, including the Lord's Supper, and to prayer. They all devoted Acts 2 tells us they were so unified that they even shared their property with each other. Our unity, of course, flows from Jesus. And it's not about psyching ourselves up, trying to be nice to each other. Unity flows as a gift from the Lord to a people who are centered on Jesus and his way of life. I like to picture it something like this. Imagine a bunch of people all kneeling at the foot of the cross. When you're standing, kneeling before the cross, you know who you are on the inside. You know, we know that we are a people. I am a person in need of God's grace and forgiveness. It takes away any pretense. I'm not better than anyone else. We look up to the dying Jesus on a cross and we say, you, you know, we look at each other and say, you know, you're here too? Yeah, we all need Jesus. We all need Jesus. Peter says, be of one mind. We are of one mind because we are a people who have sinned. We are a people who have been saved by grace. 
There's no superstars here except Jesus Christ and him alone. The question, of course, is how are we doing? How are we doing as an individual with our, our brothers and sisters around us? How are we as a church? Unity is like the choir singing the same song. You won't have many people listening if one person is sing, singing this song and another person is singing another song somewhere out there. We're all different. So the idea here is harmonizing the different parts. I have my part, you have your part. So that's number one in the passage here, unity, unity. Two, sympathize with each other. It means to share the feelings of another person to get inside their skin, so to speak, in good times and especially when the other person is in trouble or is suffering. If I'm preoccupied with myself, it will not lead to sympathy with anyone else. Self-focus is one of those habits I was speaking about that needs to be broken. Not only broken, but replaced with things like Love, that's number three. Love each other as brothers and sisters. A tender heart, that's four. A humble attitude, that's five. A tender heart means being caring, compassionate, not only in actions, but even more in one's feelings or emotions. This is a, there's a real depth to this. It's from the guts, as it were. Because the most powerful acts of compassion, of course, come from the heart. Peter tells us to keep a humble attitude. It is a realistic estimate of oneself and a high concern for other people. We can probably sum up all that Peter has said so far in one word, blessing. That's number six. Verse nine says this, don't repay evil for evil. Don't retaliate with insults when people insult you. Instead, here it is, pay them back with a blessing. Think of that when you're driving. <laughs> that is what God has called us to do, and he will grant you his blessing. Verse 10. Imagine what your day would be like if you got up in the morning partnering with Jesus and said, ah, how can I be a blessing to the people around me today? Whatever situation I'm in, that clerk at the, at the store, that fellow driver on the highway. How can I be a blessing? To behave like this is encouraged, is encouraged by knowing that Christians themselves will ultimately inherit God's blessing. The blessing is promised in Psalm 34, 12 to 16, which is quoted here. For the scriptures say, if you want to enjoy life and see many happy days, keep your tongue from speaking evil and your lips from telling lies. Turn away from evil and do good. Search for peace and work. There's our part to maintain it. The eyes of the Lord watch over those who do right and his ears are open to their prayers. Folks, I want the Lord as you do, to be open to our prayers. And I believe that one of the ways that God is open to our prayers is that when we come before him humbly in repentance, you know, the Bible tells us that it's his mercy. In other words, it's the love of God that leads us to repentance, to admit we are weak, we are weak sinners, but God is good. And I'm praying that God might somehow do some inner heart surgery in you and in me. Repentance is a process, but it must start with sorrow. We need to bow humbly before our God and ask him to expose any prejudice, any apathy, you know, whatever sin that we struggle with, especially in our culture today, where there is so many needy people. And it is, it's easy to just have a blind eye, a deaf ear to those all around us. We need to look inside again. 
and we ask the Lord to show us anything in our hearts that needs to be changed and to have uh, those new habits, as it were, ingrained in our life. We need to linger in prayer, asking the Lord's grace and his wisdom at this time. So let's do that right now. Father, again, we thank you for the word of God, which at many, many times is so challenging in our day. And so, Lord Jesus, as we come before you, we are confident of your grace, in your grace. And Lord, we say, you are good. Father, we confess for the things in our lives that are unholy, our attitudes, Lord, our actions, our words, cleanse our lips, Lord, cleanse our hearts. Help us to be the bride that you desire pure and spotless before you. We ask you, Lord Jesus, to hear our prayers today. And we ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. We continue our service with the Lord's Prayer. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. And we pray together the prayer of thanksgiving. Almighty God, Father of all mercies, we, your unworthy servants, give you humble thanks for all your goodness and loving kindness to us and to all whom you have made. We bless you for our creation, preservation, and all the blessings of this life. But above all, for your immeasurable love in the redemption of the world by our Lord Jesus Christ, for the means of grace and for the hope of glory. And we pray, give us such an awareness of your mercies that with truly thankful hearts we may show forth your praise, not only with our lips, but in our lives, by giving up ourselves to your service and by walking before you in holiness and righteousness all our days. Through Jesus Christ our Lord, to whom with you and the Holy Spirit be honor and glory throughout all ages. Amen. The peace of God, which passes all understanding, keep your hearts and minds in the knowledge and love of God and of his Son, Jesus Christ, our Lord. And the blessing of God Almighty, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit be among you and remain with you always. Amen. Well, God bless you and have a wonderful week. Thanks for joining us.